So, good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is Kai Bird. I'm the relatively new executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography here at CUNY Graduate Center. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you to what should be a fascinating conversation with David Garrow, the author of the recently published biography, Rising Star, The Making of Barack Obama. David is an extraordinary biographer and perhaps best known in the right to privacy and the making of Roe versus Wade, perhaps the definitive history of the American struggle, struggle for re reproductive rights. And this is Rising Star. Different bathroom scales give, give different answers. <laughs> that is the sound of biography. <laughs> Biography is not easy, I have to say. I speak from personal experience. I've written four or five of them. This book took David nine years to research and write. Not surprisingly, it, is all, it also places onerous demands on the reader. But I assure you, if you wish to understand the world around you, and in this case the world of one Barack Obama, well, your efforts will be well rewarded. I'm now going to interrogate David for a bit about his work. And Thank you. Let's retrieve this. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. So, David, why Obama? Just a simple question. How did you choose this president? Why, how, why did, where did you get the obsession to, to do this? In early 2008, uh, when Barack won the Iowa caucuses, um, I was embarrassed, given what I've, much of what I've written in the past, that I knew nothing about him. And so I bought the cheapest possible copy of Dreams from My Father in paperback, uh, read it on vacation in Funchal, Madeira. I highly recommend Madeira, though it's hard to get to from the US. Um, and I then kept reading the biographical journalism across the course of 2008, the campaign year and got increasingly disappointed at how incurious uh, the mainstream journalism was. Uh, keep in mind, too, we had all the wacko world, he wasn't born in Hawaii folks uh, out there, too. Um, less curious, less inquisitive about Barack's life. Only after the inauguration in early 2009 did I first go to Chicago uh, with an initial plan just to speak with the community organizing mentors who had, had uh, employed Barack between 85 and 88. And my very first conversation there with Greg Galuzzo, who was uh, Barack's sort of top mentor, Greg said to me, oh, you should go meet Mary Ann Wilson, the lawyer who did the of our community groups. And as some of you in the audience uh, probably have, have the experience to, to know, uh, tax lawyers save their files. And so the, the next morning or the morning thereafter, I go see Miss Wilson. She pulls out this manila folder of all these documents that Barack had typed up in 1987, uh, which listed all the members of his community group, uh, say 45 people or so, maybe three of whom had been discovered 
uh, by any reporters. Uh, so voila, you know, two days in, uh, all of a sudden I've got this list of... So wait a minute, you'd already decided to do the book by then? I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Back at that time, New Republic piece. Um, that's like early April of 2009, and I, that led me to get more serious, though, you know, having the names and phone numbers and addresses of people living in housing projects on the far south side of Chicago in 1986 doesn't necessarily mean you can find them easily in 2009. Uh, in contrast, when you get to the point where you're looking for 1991 graduates of Harvard Law School, uh, Harvard Law School graduates are quite easy to find. This subject, I, and I ask you this because I, I have gone back and forth on this question. Personally, I've written about people that I initially decided I, starting out, thought were evil or were war criminals or, and, uh, and yet I've also written about Robert Oppenheimer, who I admire. On the other hand, I often was incredibly annoyed by Oppenheimer's behavior <laughs> as I discovered it. Um, and, and specifically, I recall at one point in the book, you tell at great length and very colorfully how the young Obama in his very first race vanquished Alice Palmer in, in this first Senate race that he, and I think it's an amazing story. And it, so I'm asking you about that anecdote, but also about your feelings for Obama. Oh, let, let me give you a, an, an incomplete starting in the fall of 1979. Um, from 1980 forward, Dr. King has always been a very tangible, powerful presence in my life. I had thought when I finished Bearing the Cross, the, the third of my civil rights books, I thought when I finished BTC that I would be doing a big book on the J. Edgar Hoover FBI, and I still have several shelves of uh, uh, lots of uh, I realized very quickly once I got into that that I had zero appetite whatsoever to spend three or four years with retired FBI agents because they're <laughs> just not pleasant people. <laughs> Um, and, and keep in mind, back before BTC, I did a book on the FBI's pursuit of King. Uh, the Bureau and the Justice Department came after me pretty seriously back at that time. Um, so I was already well versed in uh, both the Bureau and, and the agency. Um, the great joy of doing what I've done, whether we which will always remain my favorite book, uh, whether with this book, is you get to meet hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wonderful people. Um, the, the pleasurable part of doing this for me um, is not the writing, uh, not getting interviewed by people, sorry. It's meeting people who have not had a chance to tell their story. Uh, when we did Eyes on the Prize, uh, the big PBS history of the black freedom struggle that was almost uh, simultaneous with BTC, in Eyes we called this the Freddie Leonard effect. Mr. Leonard was a little known freedom rider. Um, you know, in the country, I interviewed 1,879 times. When 
Mr. Leonard was first interviewed for Eyes, no one had ever asked Mr. Leonard his story. And if you ever see the video of Eyes, Mr. Leonard is talking about clutching his mattress in Parchman Penitentiary in Mississippi. Um, so finding people who've not been interviewed before to me is the richest part of doing history and that's why this is such a rich book um, because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who knew Barack well, uh, especially down in, in Springfield, the Illinois State Capitol where he spent eight years. Um, um, finally, apologies. Barack Obama from 1985 to about 2001 is someone who I liked very much. Um, but one of the big lessons of this book is that that Barack Obama is not the person whom we ended up with in the presidency. Oh. Well, I, I was going to say, on the other hand, the portrait you have of Obama is one of a incredibly intelligent admirable about that. Uh, you know, this is a young man who was not going to waste his life despite the cocaine, the weed, the, at a certain point he took control and, and he had almost LBJ-like calculations. I mean, he is, I didn't realize this until reading the book, but he is a, an astute calculator. He's a consummate diplomat. I mean, he's an amazing politician on the way up. Right. <laughs> um, and then there, the book is filled with ironies to me that, you know, he clearly is uh, not an African American. He is Hawaiian in his Absolutely. childhood experience. Uh, he's a community organizer who actually turns to politics, electoral politics, because of his dislike. And this is an irony because the right-wing press, of course, always blamed pigeonholed yes. Obama as this Alinsky commie community organizer, when in fact he apparently walks away from this disillusioned yes, yes. by the experience. He's always the cool dude, despite the weed and the cocaine, and always incredibly focused in his 20s. Uh, and, and to illustrate this, you tell this uh, <laughs> funny story about Brock calmly shaking a rat off his oh, yes. trousered legs. Uh, anyway, it's, it's an amazing portrait in that way. But it's the surprise is that Obama is not Saul Alinsky. He is, in fact, a politician. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the real crux of this book, chapter four, is Barack's self-transformation in Chicago, uh, 1985 to 1988, the community organizing years. Uh, when he's working down in, in Roseland and Altgeld Gardens on the far south side. African-American community. Um, you know, having grown up in Hawaii, living in Indonesia a bit, um, as, as at least one person here tonight uh, mentioned to me earlier, um, Barack's whole friendship network uh, up through his, his first years after college um, is entirely Pakistani and, and South Asian guys. Um, he's living in this sort of international world that's neither particularly white uh, nor at all black. Um, one thing that the Alinsky tradition taught organizers 
was that you practice a complete separation, absolute separation, and Barack adopted that piece of the Alinsky tradition uh, immediately. Um, you know, he spends those years in Chicago living with a young woman who's a, a U of C graduate student, half Dutch, half Japanese, uh, you know, who nowadays is, is one of the top US experts on Korea. Uh, but virtually none of the people in Barack's community group ever met her, nor, nor did she ever meet any of them. Um, you know, they talked about getting married. Um, even in 1988, he wanted her to, to go to Harvard with him. Um, remarkable that someone could serve eight years as President of the United States um, and someone with whom he had lived for two plus years, someone with whom he was involved for close to five years, uh, was never revealed, and and again, lazy I, journalists, huh? <laughs> well, I say I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll now I'll tell you the punchline. Uh, you know, anyone who'd made the effort to walk into Regenstein Library at the University of Chicago and pull the student directories uh, from eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight off the shelf and look at who else lived. who else lived there. Um, we also found a very nice couple who lived upstairs who are both on the faculty at North Carolina State now. Um, it's, it's not rocket science. That's why we need biographers, huh? And why we need, oh, I, I love to do this. It's why we need librarians and archivists. Um, one of my favorite things in this book, uh, and, and I look at uh, someone who's a, a character over here as I say this, when Barack leaves Manhattan leaves West 50th Street in the summer. In Western Pennsylvania, just before the Ohio border, and has this memorable conversation with the motel owner. Um, now, he his first recounting of this conversation is in a long letter. Uh, to his girlfriend here in New York, whom he had wanted to, to go to Chicago with him, who, who turned him down, Genevieve, Genevieve. Cook, uh, Australian, daughter of an Australian diplomat. And so Genevieve had, had saved Barack's letters, um, gave them to me, I guess about three years ago now. And so in this letter to Genevieve, about 10 years ago, Barack names the motel. Now, Barack also, even in commencement speeches in 2006, was still recounting this conversation with the motel owner. So, you know, I teach on a law faculty in Pennsylvania. So I said to Mark Silverman, my wonderful law librarian, here's the name of this motel, summer of 85. So Mark pulls the property records for who owns the motel in 1985. Says to me, Robert Elia. So, you know, we can all look up names in phone directories on the web. This is, again, three years ago. So I This is Bob. So that's, and, and the guy on the phone, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite parts of the book. The guy on the phone within like, 14 seconds matched up identically to how Barack described him starting back in that letter in, in August of 85. Using, using the same phrase. Oh, as... yes, 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 yeah. So uh, th that reminds me, coming back to Genevieve Cook, how did you persuade this woman who was the first of young and intense? And there were only three or right. four. Three. Three. And how did you persuade her to turn over not only her diary, but these letters that she had saved? One, in, in my experience, and again, this goes all the way back for me to, to 1979 with Dr. King, and I think it's a big difference between what we do and what journalists do, 
if you go see folks in person, they make the effort to dig out things and give them to you that they don't do when it's just some reporter on the phone. Um, Alex McNear, the first serious girlfriend, um, lives in Sag Harbor now. back in 2012. Um, Genevieve, who lives in Australia, um, Genevieve has copious uh, daily diaries from her time with Barack and had given out a few snippets uh, in 2012. Um, but we went and actually spent three days, my wife and I, uh, staying with Genevieve and her partner uh, uh, in Australia. Um, well, that's a long way to go. Right. <laughs> But it's more fun to go to Australia than to go to Springfield. <laughs> um, the, the, hard, the hard part, I mean, you know, think Albany. Week after week in Springfield, Illinois. I, the, the perhaps apocryphal phrase, and I, 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 may get the, uh, I, I may get the wording backwards, that it's a, uh, a city of bad hotels and worse food. I, I think this is a phrase that goes back some decades. So actually, speaking of the women, this is one of your themes, repeated in the book that in the early narrative that, the, that Obama decided that he could not have a successful political life if he was married to a white woman. And that's kind of, when I say that, bald but you, you create the sort of context for it. You cite, you quote other politicians in Chicago who, whose careers only went so far, and they say, bluntly, that's why. And then you, ha you actually document this with quotes from Obama's, from interviews with his friends who recount that he told them this. Um, and it's, you know, you create a, 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 a he, he's struggling to figure out who he is, both his racial identity and it, what he wants to do with his life. Um, and then you quote him at one point dismissing this notion that he couldn't have a political career if he was married to a white woman as, quote, pretty cynical and pretty offensive. And I think you may be right, and of course he is, but he was choosing, like all of us do in many ways, we're choosing wives, but we're choosing partners, life partners, if we're smart about it. And he was calculating. Right. Yeah. So I guess I'm just asking for further comment on this delicate issue. Sure. Wor working in Roseland, 85 to 88, stimulates Barack's identification as African American. This, this is the part of Chicago where yeah. he becomes a in community, the community organizing period. But he's living with someone who, just like his own background, background, comes out of this international world of anthropology and multi-ethnic multi networks. Out here, uh, surprising or difficult. Because going back through the 80s, even in the 70s, it was an article of faith in black Chicago that if you aspired to be an African American politician, you could not have a white spouse. Dick Newhouse, a protege, partner, colleague of Harold Washington, um, everyone in black Chicago believed Mosley Braun, 
a name many of you will remember. Um, by the time you come to know her, Carol's divorced, but Carol had had a white husband. Um, Tony Preckwinkle, who's now the head of, of the Cook County Board. Uh, Tony, for years, uh, suffered in black Chicago uh, because the nationalists beat up on her for having a white husband. Um, so within the political milieu of black Chicago, this was a visible, central, recurring theme. Um, intensely set his sights on an electoral political career to tell Sheila that, no, you cannot be my wife. Uh, there's nothing really astonishing in that. Except he did propose to her, yes, didn't Early he? on. Early on, yeah. and she turned him down. And this is Christmas of 1986. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and again, this is, I mean, I, going back to all my experience with the black freedom struggle in the South, um, I, I'm someone who is, is uh, very hesitant about believing stories. E.D. Nixon in Montgomery, if, if any of you know the, the municipal level history, the Montgomery bus boycott. But to me, as, as a scholarly historian, uh, what is so compelling in, in the story of, of the marriage discussions in, in December of 1986 um, is that Sheila's account um, is 100% endorsed by her parents' closest family friend, a guy named Mike Dees, um, whom her father had, had made sure was there uh, to meet the prospective son-in-law. So when you have a, you know, someone who's a completely independent voice, You know, lived with Barack for two years, uh, you know, and, and heard from him again and again uh, him saying that he felt he had this destiny to be president. Now, at the very same time, uh, the other person to whom Barack is closest is a woman whom he works with on a daily basis in the community organizing work, Lena, Mary Ellen Mont. Um, Sheila and Lena have never met each other, never spoke to each other, and Lena's recollections to me of what Barack was saying to her, 87, 88, about his destiny to be president, virtually 100% match with what Sheila's recollection is. Um, to his guy friends, uh, Mike Kruglick, Paul Scully, David Kindler, Barack is just saying, oh, I want to be, you know, mayor of Chicago. Uh, but he's to, as, as Lena says very nicely uh, in the book, uh, with Sheila and Lena, he's not saying mayor. <laughs> right. And he obviously, he so admires Mayor Washington. Exactly. Yes. And this becomes his inspiration for a political career in many ways. Um, and it's, you know, again, I, I urge readers to th not be shocked by the headlines you see in the reviews because the book really explains in the context this young man's transformation. And this is, you know, every biographer's dream is to explain our transformation from childhood to early politician. He is, I mean, he turns himself into a black man yes. in Chicago. Yeah. And, and one, one thing I, I always like to try to underscore, the young man who leaves West 50th Street in the summer of 1985, who's been doing too much cocaine with his friend Hassan in Brooklyn Heights all those prior months, Everyone thought that he was a perfect, perfectly nice guy, but 
completely unremarkable and, and not terribly memorable. That's summer of 1985. Harvard Law School at the end of August 1988, everyone in the Harvard class of 1991 who meets him from day one, week one forward, thinks, voila, this is someone we'll all be reading about in the future. So the difference between uh, people who sort of knew him passingly here in New York, 83 to 85, uh, he's working at a, a thing called Business International Corp, which is now part of the Economist <clears throat> Intelligence Unit up on 57th Street. Um, 85 and who Barack is in 88 is, is beyond dramatic. So when he's at Harvard, do you quote him, or you have a, a source, a, a friend, saying that Obama told them musingly, sort of, that he was, he'd really like to find a woman with the body of Whitney Houston and the mind of Toni Morrison. <laughs> right. Uh, he's he hasn't yet met <laughs> Michelle, but he is describing Michelle, isn't right, he? Right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. It's, it's an incredible, you know, so clearly by that moment, he knows what he wants. Relatively well known. It is very much uh, in toto him pursuing her uh, and her being uh, somewhat reluctant about this. Um, in addition, uh, and I think this is, is less well known, uh, right from 1991 when they get engaged, 1992 when they get married going forward, um, Michelle is explicitly dubious about these political career plans and is always encouraging Their, their closest social friends remember uh, her baiting him at some dinner party that he'd have, uh, you know, more to give as a high school principal than as a state legislator. Um, only when Barack finally succeeds in, in 2004 um, in winning the, the Democratic uh, Senate nomination in Illinois, only in 2004 does, does Michelle begin to get on board. Uh, with, with him being a political candidate. And for folks in black Chicago who knew them uh, across the course of the 90s, Michelle becoming an enthusiastic political campaigner uh, is the most astonishing transformation of all. Wow, yeah. So coming back for, mo for a moment to the Harvard years at, law, at the law school, yeah. One clear tipping point in his career is his election as the president yes, of the yes, Harvard yes. Law Review. And that's an amazing event. And amazing for the way that Barack quietly, in a calculated fashion, wins that race. And it seems to make Would you agree? Um, let me try a different riff on that, and this is not something I've said before in an interview context, so I'm not sure this is going to work, but the thought occurs. Um, black law students at Harvard in the late 80s felt very put upon and very suspect because criticisms of affirmative action left them questioning their self-worth and whether they really belonged there. Michelle had graduated three months before Barack got there in 88. Had made a huge effort to get black law students to take active roles in all sorts of campus organizations because there was this group 
consensus among the black law students that we want to demonstrate that we do belong at Harvard. That's the context in which black students who are on the law review, the big deal at Harvard, they get focused on winning masthead positions. Now, you know, I don't have a JD, but I've taught in law faculties for 20 years. Somebody that's never lived in a world of law schools, this does have an arcane quality to it about the hierarchy of law reviews. But by the time that Barack's class is, is up for elevation on the law review, the black students in the class ahead of them organize this very energetic behind the scenes campaign to elevate uh, someone black from the class behind them to this pinnacle position. In a way, and this is my new riff on this, and of 1955. You know, Dr. King had no desire to be a public figure whatsoever. He, he feels drafted, called to that role. Now, Barack had not, unlike some people, his friend Julius Janikowski being one, there were some people who'd been running public campaigns. But it's more an experience of the older black law students pushing Barack forward um, and in the odd parts of and the conservative Federalist Society law students all go with Barack uh, as opposed to his more academic -y ACLU civil rights competitor, David Goldberg. Uh, because the conservatives believe that Barack is the less ideological, uh, more open-minded uh, of the finalists. And, and as I talk about a good deal in the book, and, and this is very much new, uh, over the course of Barack's Uh, get very angry at Barack's presidency uh, because they think he's uh, much too uh, uh, conciliatory uh, with the Federalist Society types and is not standing up for progressive values. Right, and this happens again in his presidency yes. too, I guess, with some liberals who are unhappy with how, you know, that he's not radical enough. Huh? Right. But, um, so. It, Oh, let's cover a few more issues and then we'll open it up to questions. But um, my father is historical fiction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that it's not autobiography with footnotes, clearly. And but you you argue that it's not even memoir. That, right. You know he goes a step farther. And. <clears throat> I, I, you know, your argument is, I, I was skeptical initially. I thought, well, you know, he's just written a memoir and taken some liberties as all memoirists do in a sort of sloppy way. And, but in the context of your portrait, And he's, you know, he makes composites out of his one white girlfriend in the memoir, uh, because partly because he wants to protect them, I think, and it's it's a natural thing to do. Um, but he's also trying to achieve that transformation yes, yes, of yes. becoming black. In yes. it. So it's necessary to emphasize certain narratives over others and. To the book, I, I I remember reading it like you did, um, 
actually before he ran for president. And I, just, I was just struck by it. It was really well written. It was engaging. And, and I'm, I'm kind of shocked that you, you've right, <laughs> right. persuaded me that right. so much of it is really not the case. Yes. No, I, I, think, I think a number of people who uh, over the years got deeply infatuated with the book uh, are, are, are unhappy uh, uh, to have that questioned. Um, two things in particular. Um, and very unhappy, antisocial, acting out, uh, calls himself a thug at one point in his demeanor. Now, I've spoken with 80 people, at least, who knew him at Punahou in Honolulu, the prep school he went to, classmates, teachers, dean of students, etc. Not a single three best friends, agrees at all with Barack's self-presentation in dreams. Um, you know, the best witness of all, Eric Kusunoki, who was his homeroom teacher, saw him every morning, you know, throughout four years of high school. Um, you know, everyone describes him as this happy, friendly, smiling, always polite young man. You know, he's, he's on He's playing basketball all three years, finally works his way up to the, you know, the varsity team. Um, he actually published this essay in his senior year yearbook, which somehow the journalists never heard. It's the ultimate rah-rah manifestation of someone who is just ecstatic about playing on a winning high school basketball team. Um, you know, Barack starts writing that manuscript in 1991, uh, you know, 12 years after he graduates high school. Um, and I'll say this archly, and I think some of you will get the joke. Uh, you know, the person who's working with him most closely uh, in crafting that book um, is his best friend at Harvard Law School, Rob Fisher, um, older, uh, Friday night playing sort of the, the Kai role here. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Um, but what Barack did in that book, both in, in completely recasting his childhood um, and in telling the story of his years in Chicago uh, with barely a one sentence reference to Sheila, who's actually combined with Alex and Genevieve in a, uh, a sort of three-part uh, um, There are some elements in the Chicago portion of that book that come from Barack's journals. Um, as Sheila stressed to me, uh, the whole concluding portion of Dreams, his trip to Kenya, is a reprinting of his letters to Sheila while he's in Kenya. Um, down the road, uh, for people who have a, a, a literary background that I completely lack, I think the absence and diminution of women in Dreams uh, will... His mother. be a, a theme that, that uh, eventually comes to the fore. Um, okay, I, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to wrap this up. But uh, coming to the epilogue, I, I want to know why you felt compelled to write about the presidency at all after spending a thousand pages on Barack the childhood, the young man. Um, and I guess this go goes also to the question of the... Did you ever consider 
having two volumes, doing a Robert Caro treatment of, you know, five volumes, and, you know, leave the presidency, which is a big, complicated right. topic, too. But you deal with it in, what, about four, uh, 40? Oh, 50 pages. 50 40, page, 40, yeah. 50 page. Two, or, two or three things. Um, more than half of the epilogue is about the campaign in 2007, 2008, and mainly focuses on biographical issues that came up in the campaign. Jeremiah, right? Um, and I want to stress I'm someone who loves Cornell West. I mean, I come from a DSA background. Um, when Barack, as president, makes the decision in 2012 to reach out to Sheila for the first time in 21 years, um, that may not have been the smartest thing he did during eight years in the White House. But it then rock in person myself till uh, about 15, 13, 14 months ago now, back last spring. Um, I think many of you have, have read about how Barack himself read the whole manuscript of this. Uh, that was my summer. next question. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, but in the in the weird ways of Washington, uh, you know, those are all officially off the record, so I can't quote him. Um, I had I, I dropped the ball on one thing you asked here, and I'm, I'm uh, looking at my publisher who's never heard this before. will not uh, mention here uh, that the notion of publishing two volumes on Barack Obama was incomprehensible, uh, even though they were publishing three volumes on Joseph Stalin. Um, but I am uh, incredibly, uh, deeply grateful to HarperCollins uh, for making the commitment uh, view this as a book of record, um, something which without question people will still be going back to 30 or 35 years from now. If this book had ended up with another house, I think that uh, the chapters on Barack's political career in Illinois and his years in the state legislature in Springfield uh, would have been shrunken down very badly. Um, I think those years in Springfield are essential. Um, one of my favorites would be my last thing I, I say here. Um, and I mentioned this to someone, uh, whatever, eight months ago, who insisted that there was, that. This was not remembered at all. I'm, I'm saying this in a purposely arch way. Um, but one of my favorite, uh, maybe my favorite all-time story from his years in Springfield is when he ends up voting essentially to anger Roberta Lynch, the head of Ask Me District Council 31, uh, whose endorsement he desperately sought uh, in the 2004 Senate race. Uh, for any of you who come out of the labor movement, this is one reflection of the Ask Me SEIU Tong War uh, that was taking place during those years. In Illinois, the Tong War was over who had jurisdiction to authorize home health care workers. Uh, 
wonderfully telling story. It is, it is. All right, finally, um, Obama read the, the manuscript, or yes. much of it. Um, All, did, everything except the epilogue. Everything except the epilogue. Did he persuade you to change anything or add anything? Um, I added a number of little things where he almost by accident told me things that I hadn't figured out, uh, but they're very particular facts. How did he first put together his syllabus when he starts teaching at the U of C? Um, I changed several dozen little things, um, none of them of any uh, okay. real significance. Finally, why no photographs in this big book? Um, <laughs> Now I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, I, I, now you know from experience, I bet. Uh, I love the photos. Uh, pu pu publishers expect to, yes, to pay for the photos. <laughs> exactly. Um, there are probably three sets of photos of Barack that would be worth using. Um, some of which date from Harvard Law School, and it's really unclear who took them. Uh -oh. If it's in the Harvard you know, Law School yearbook and it's not really labeled who took it. The other two photographers, one here in New York, one in Chicago, uh, they know what they've got. They've not been reprinted much. Um, I think to have had a photo It's, it, it, it's as, as you demonstrated very memorably earlier. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's the only serious failing in the book. Okay. 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 <laughs> well, we, we can always revisit this for the paperback, Leon. All right. Well, let's open it up now to questions from the audience. I'm sure you must have thoughts. And I, I hope specifically. Obama, could you, could you tell us about that disappointment, why? Oh, certainly. Um, I mean, I can give you a number of examples on this. Um, number one, I think this is quite well known, when Barack first starts running for office back in Illinois in 95, uh, he endorses gay marriage. Um, he backs off from that quite quickly in Illinois. Um, you know, and, and he doesn't return to his own true conviction until Joe Biden, you know, happens to Um, all throughout his years in the state legislature, um, Barack is a very uh, outspoken proponent of universal single payer uh, health care coverage. Um, you know, I lived in Britain for six years. I'm a huge fan of socialized medicine. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm a Bernie Sanders sort of democratic socialist. Um, Obamacare. Uh, ended up as a big wet kiss to the for-profit insurance industry. Um, the long term to me as, as a Democrat, uh, strengthening the footprint of the for-profit insurance industry uh, is not the direction uh, to go in the long term. Most importantly of all, up through even 2005, 2006, when he is in the US Senate, but starting very strongly back in 2001, uh, Barack was a, a muscular critic of the Patriot Act, uh, the CIA, uh, government surveillance, the whole national security state. Um, so the Obama president, John Brennan and the torturers, um, I'm, I'm a public fan of, of Ed Snowden, um, but embracing the intelligence community uh, in, in, to the extent that he did 
um, all the uh, investigations and prosecutions of, of leakers, people like Jeffrey Sterling from the agency. Um, and then lastly, and th this is the hardest part for I think a lot of people, up through 2004, Barack and Michelle lived a very modest middle class life. Uh, you know, they finally paid off the law school loans. So to end up in the White House uh, uh, coveting all of this time with Hollywood celebrities and musicians and movie stars and Richard Branson, you know, we, we've seen this again this spring with, you know, islands in the Caribbean, islands in French Polynesia. Um, all the, yeah. Uh, I believe that the presidency transformed both into hugely different people today than, than who they were in 2004. Thank you. I think they want to give you the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, Obama, as we know, was um, attacked for all sorts of things that were ridiculous lies. You know, that he was Kenyan, he was gay, blah, blah. How did he really respond to that? I mean, he's always known for the no drama, keep the anger down, but I can't believe he... Here, I'm, I'm sort of skating a little bit on my edge of that everything he said to me over the course of eight hours is off the record. Uh, so I'm going to say it again in a slightly sort of vague voice. Um, and, and this is this is my own opinion, and it's, it's based on all sorts of things. I think the experience of the presidency and the experience of all this wacky criticism during the presidency had the cumulative, cumulative effect of greatly at black. Uh, and again, this is my reading. I'm really stressing this. This is my reading. I think that as all of that hostility kept on after the first campaign, very, you know, repeated, grew, transmogrified, I think he came to process that with a belief that much of this was not ideological or partisan. It was first and foremost because he was of a different color. Um, so Yeah, that's the best I've that's the best I've been able to say that so far. Uh, oh, he's got the mic. Okay. All right, pardon me. Uh, I'm very uh, intrigued by your discussion of uh, his evolution, so to speak, towards blackness, which I think is pretty key to him as well. Uh, could you talk a little bit about his relationship with his grandparents, uh, his mother's parents, and also I believe believe. Um, the election, yes. Yes. and along with that in mind, from another perspective, his years as a boy in uh, Indonesia, and how that fits into this whole evolution. Right. Stan and Madeline raised him, and, and that's something this book says very insistently. Um, you all know that he was abandoned by his father at age one. He, he sees his father for 10 or 12 days, you know, when he's age 10, and that's it. But all of his closest friends in high school, African American students at Punahou, um, the, the very elite prep school he attended in Honolulu, um, Keith Peterson, uh, thought Barack had been adopted by this, this older white couple. Um, most of his friends don't ever, re ever remember meeting his mother. Um, 
the portrayal that Barack gives of Stan, his grandfather, in Dreams from My Father, um, is, to my mind, so demeaning and, and unloving that it's always something that's troubled me. Uh, because you talk to people, uh, other adults, Neil Abercrombie, former governor of Hawaii, who, who uh, was one of Obama seniors' uh, friends uh, as students together um, back in the early 60s. Um, and, and Neil watched Stanley raise Barack across the course of the 1960s. Um, uh, Barack's ambivalence about his grandparents is, is something I've never liked. Um, there's a similar ambivalence about almost all the members of his Kenyan family. Um, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think there's very clear evidence of uh, a very deep distaste for who his father was. Uh, you know, his father ends up leading a very tragic life, serious alcoholic, uh, serial wife beater. Um, I think it's a very deep central piece of Barack to avoid, 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 uh, most of the paternal legacy. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I this got exaggerated too back during the campaign, to some extent by the wackos, but but not all the wackos. Um, he's actually in Indonesia barely more than two years. Um, he's an elementary school student. Uh, maybe it's that my memories of third grade in my own life are virtually non-existent. Um, but I, uh, I, I think the Indonesian impact is relatively less than people might imagine. He's Hawaiian. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Kai said this so nicely earlier. Um, in, in, and, I, and I say it at one point very uh, explicitly. Um, in, in all the ways that count, I mean, Barack is first and foremost Hawaiian. Yeah. No, his laid back attitude, his sort of tolerance, his... Uh, and, you know. and Barack, at multiple times over the years, has expressly called himself lazy. <laughs> and there is considerable truth to that. And on at least one occasion, he very explicitly has said that stems from growing up in Hawaii, that it's so laid back. Yeah. The, la the lady right here. If well, now I have a few things okay. to say. I've read that he was a very serious worker all his years in the White House, and that he slept very little and would read late into the night and work on things. So. I don't think that's lazy, but um, my question was, I, I understand the things that you're disappointed, but really, do you think with the obstructionism and, and really hatred and disregard, which is racial, that he could have gotten through a one-payer or done any of those other things? The contrast, this, this is, this is a, a great question, to me, the contrast that is so striking is between how Barack, his first six years in Springfield, coped with being in the minority in a state senate chamber that was controlled by Republicans who were vastly more conservative than a Mitch McConnell uh, or, a, or a Paul Ryan. Uh, the fellow who is head of the, the Illinois State Senate those six years, Pate Phillip, uh, was a virulent racist. Use the N-word. Um, I had a quite memorable meeting with him at the, at the O'Hare Airport Hilton. Um, uh, but to rephrase my question, do you think that any of the things that you are faulting him for would have 
been possible in any world that we live in? I think Barack could, from the first weeks of his presidency, done a vastly better personal outreach to congressional Republicans than he did. In Springfield, both with conservative Republicans, Dave Severson, Kirk Dillard, Carl Hawkinson, and in befriending downstate conservative white Democrats with whom he had very little in common other than card playing, Denny Jacobs, Larry Walsh, Terry Link. In Springfield, with all these white guys, Barack is not hanging out at the black table in the cafeteria, if you know the line. In Springfield, both with these really conservative Republicans and with these almost southern, if you know southern Illinois, almost southern white Democrats, Barack develops really uh, enduring uh, both workplace and social relationships that serve him extremely well. When he decides to run for the U.S. Senate in 02, he's got these white county chairmen from Quad Cities over on the uh, Iowa border, um, from Joliet, Will County, south of Chicago, from Waukegan, Lake County, north of Chicago, um, he's got all these bases of support because he's made a concerted effort over the years uh, to do face-to-face -face outreach. Now, the Barack Obama we saw in the White House was not doing this sort of personal outreach with a Mitch McConnell. That, to me, is a very... Surprising contrast. Question. I don't want to debate with you, but didn't Mitch McConnell say from day one when he got elected, yeah. I will do yeah. everything to bring this presidency down? I mean, you could reach out, but you can, you know, not make it far enough if the person you're reaching out to is so... But it, 18 um, months, 18 months go by before McConnell is invited to the White House for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That is not the Barack who was in Springfield. The way he recruits Dave Severson and these other Republicans to support what's called kid care, a sort of chip type program, it's just what we see with the Freedom Caucus today. Oh, this is an entitlement program. Barack wins this expansion of health care coverage for poor children in Illinois by romancing a batch of Senate Republicans one-on-one, -on -one, all personal contact, and he didn't do that in the White House. So That's David, are you saying that, that he didn't do it in the White House because he got lazy and once he won the presidency, he just didn't do the Thank work? The world of the Obama White House was so partisan that Barack could not be who he had been on his own in Springfield. This, 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 what we're doing here is a great example of why to me, and it's why this book is as, is as big as it is, because if you really immerse yourself in the story of what Barack did in Springfield and how he achieved what he did in a more unfavorable context than what he had in the spring of 2009, a large part of what I am indicating in the epilogue is that he forgot some of the lessons that he had known and practiced and benefited from during these years in the wilderness in Springfield. I think the context of a Trump presidency leads people to have rosier memories of the Obama years than we might otherwise be having. Yes, next question. I'm a Jewish grandmother and I taught at Hunter College sociology of inequality. I cannot tell you what it looks to me for an Afro-American 
president to have been a president for eight years. It's nothing short of miracle. Nothing short of miracle. Okay. As a Jewish grandmother, you did not mention that his mother, I did not read your book, but I did read The Audacity of Hope, and I did read the first book, Dreams of My Father. I remember in Dreams of My Father, his mother woke him up early in the morning to do his homework. I saw none shred of it in your book. Perhaps this has something to do with his going to Harvard. Maybe, maybe not. Now, my heart broke about his grandmother, who lived almost on the threshold of the presidency. How do you know that they were not a happy couple, the grandmother and the grandfather? Where did you get this? That they were not a happy couple? That I didn't. he was not happy with his grandparents. Oh, uh, his portrayal uh, of his grandparents in Dreams from My Father is, to my mind, downright demeaning. Uh, I, I, uh, I think there's no question his, his portrayal of them in that book is, is demeaning. Oh, sorry, um, yeah. where's the mic? Yeah, I just wanted to see if, um, I'm uh, Associate General Counsel at Columbia University where Barack Obama spent two years. In the 208 campaign, um, someone wrote a letter to one of our Columbia magazines pointing out that Obama had written a nuclear freeze article yes. when he was a student there, and they asked me, should they, should, they print, should they print this? So it was about three weeks before the election. In my innermost mind, I'm thinking, hell no, we don't want this printed because it'll be used incorrectly by the Republicans when this guy was a student. And it was a well, as I remember, it was a well-written article, but uh, it wouldn't have gone over well in 2008. So I asked the editor, what's your normal policy? when someone wants to print something about someone else, he said, well, we asked the person whether it's okay to do it. I said, that's a great idea. Why don't you write the Obama campaign, send it by snail mail, and when's your next issue? <laughs> it's after the election. That's a great idea. Let's do that. But, but after the election, it did come out, this yes. article. I yes. remember seeing it, I think, between the election and the inauguration. And it didn't get much play, and it wasn't that big a deal. So uh, No, and, and, and there's a letter that Barack wrote to one of his best friends uh, just at the time that he's writing that, and he uh, basically characterizes the article as resume fodder, you know, that, that, he, that he wants to publish something so that he can have it on his resume when he's applying for jobs. Now, you've given me a, a, a great uh, uh, opportunity to very quickly tell uh, uh, one of my other favorite stories in this book. The reason that Barack has never released his transcripts, Punahou, Occidental, Columbia, Harvard Law School, and I can say this with quite considerable authority, is because his final semester at Columbia, he takes a sociology elective titled State Socialist Societies. Yeah, okay. You can all, and, and Kai's read this, you, you can all easily uh, uh, imagine where, where that could have gone. Um, but thankfully, uh, there's a, a fellow classmate, an attorney in Washington, who saved the syllabus from spring of 1983. And uh, I spend probably two pages in the book narrating these readings on the syllabus because it's a double irony. Every single one of the readings is critical of socialist societies, critical of the Soviet Union, critical of the People's Republic of China. Um, it's, it's a sort of, you know, Milovangelis type of, of literature. Um, uh, the young, uh, the then very young beginning assistant professor who taught it, Andrew Walder, he's, he's now at, at uh, Stanford. Um, but that's the reason why we went through this eight or nine year public debate about why won't he release his transcripts. Nobody ever saw him there. Oh, no, plenty. I mean, there are, uh, uh, there are a number of people all in this book who clearly remember being in class with Barack. Again, the journalism back in 2007, 2008 uh, was just frankly not very good. Um, you know, to me, I mean, Kai, Kai made reference to the, the Harvard Law Review presidential election. Uh, there were probably about 70 people in the room that day, and I've spoken with, I'd say, 55 to 60 of them. 
Um, and that's the difference, to my mind, bet between history and journalism. Uh, you know, you, you doing what I do, uh, you try to get everyone you can, not just a sort of quick sample. So I'm happy to see that there's more Columbia people here. I was a college in uh, Columbia College, Columbia Law School graduate before they were teaching courses like that when it was super academic. Anyway, uh, question for you. Do you think that the experience of the last four Democratic presidents, Kennedy who was shot out of office and not necessarily by a sole assassin, Johnson forced out, Carter who was sort of pushed out with the, with the October surprise, and Clinton who, so, who survived two terms but was impeached and, went, and got, had a, played a role in how Obama who successfully survived two terms in office with no impeachment and nothing really that threatened his, uh, threatened his reputation for eth ethics or honesty, that played a role in how he approached it, in his understanding of history and the delicate position that uh, you're in, even as a moderate in uh, incrementalist, really weighed on him in terms of what he wanted to do and, and, and basically from, his in from a standpoint of ambition, which is serve out two terms and not have to go through the insanity that the last four presidents went through. Um, what I have heard again and again and again from people in Chicago, people in Illinois, particularly people in black Chicago, and, and I continue to see it in email uh, this last three weeks or so, um, people were so disappointed by how unaudacious this presidency was. Um, my biggest disappointments with that presidency uh, were first and foremost Syria. Uh, but we, we, I'm not going to take us off on that right now. I would, I would say in a positive vein to you, I think the two greatest positive lasting legacies of the Obama presidency uh, can be stated in four simple words. Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan, uh, because both Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan will still be there in 25 years, uh, long after almost everything else that we might argue about here tonight will have come and gone. Wow. <laughs> Maybe. Well, and we could, again, say the same thing already about the Trump presidency. 25 years from now, we will still have Neil Gorsuch. That's, that's the reality of, of our system. Can you... Oh, yes. Uh, I'd just like to know what uh, ha has been his relationship with the Kings, the King family? Just because um, you're an expert on, on almost that. non-existent. Just, yeah. I mean, the more in, to riff off of that a bit, um, someone within the last five or six days, it's all been a blur, asked me about his his relationship with the Jackson family, and the important answer there, and, and this is very significant in in Illinois political terms, his relationship with Reverend Jackson Sr. was was very limited. I mean, uh, similarly with Harold Washington, uh, Barack goes to see Reverend Jackson speak up in Harlem in during the 1984 campaign, and that's a very early glimmering of of the, the impact that Washington later has, but. Barack and Jesse Jackson Jr. ended up having a very close relationship, and that, of course, is uh, you know a very sad story. I mean, I was uh, uh, I forget the name of the email program. I was regularly doing email with Jesse Jr. when he was in federal prison, but I think it's called Correct Links. There's a a special private email program that federal prisoners are, are able to use. Um, okay. Wow. Any, any more questions? Um, I'm just curious if you can speculate about his post-presidency career, whether he'll be politically active. I mean, Trump is, uh, you know, Trump is Trump, and will he be part of the, quote, resistance, or wh where do you see him headed? Um, I'm 
as, as we've seen already this spring with the $400,000 $400, speeches, and I guess we've all seen the figure 60 million on the books, um, I do not think he will be as active as Hillary Clinton will be. Um, but this, to me, the contrast between who they were in 2004 and now they're renting a house and the monthly rent is $22,000 to rent a house, I, that's, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that. That's, uh, you know, maybe it's my, my grounding in Dr. King, but that to me is is a, a bridge way 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 too far you know the the real contrast is going to be in terms of the post presidency is going to be between obama and carter yes 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 you know jimmy carter whom i'm writing a a book about i don't think it'll be as long as this <laughs> <laughs> but, but i could aspire to it uh, but Carter still lives to this day in the same house that he built in 1960, a little one-story ranch, very unassuming, in Plains, yep. Georgia. Yep. Yep. And yes, he raises money for the Carter Center, uh, but he does not, he's not asked to give speeches by Goldman Sachs or other <laughs> Wall Street venues for obvious reasons. And, uh, so I'd, I'd like, I mean, it's going to be interesting. Obama could follow in the footsteps of Bill Clinton in his post-presidency, or he could take after Jimmy Carter, but it would be hard work. Yes. <laughs> for no, this. Kai, Kai, Kai has just given a better answer than I did. I'm, I, wholly, I wholly endorse uh, this comparison. Well, it's almost 8 o'clock, and unless there's someone dying to ask one more question... All right. <laughs> um, since you, you've had a chance to meet him, um, what, is your, what do you think his uh, emotional reaction is to the, the assault of Trump and all of this uh, garbage? Okay, uh, I'm going to interrupt here and, sure. and say one thing. This is the man who wrote an op-ed in January, just before Trump was inaugurated, saying that he should fire Comey and all the other intelligence chiefs right away. Yes. <laughs> so I want, I want to know what, why you did that. Um, this could go on for a while. Uh, I spent years reading FBI and CIA, CIA documents, years and years, through all the King stuff, the Malcolm stuff, everything about the movement. If you guys, if some of you folks remember the, 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 the dossier about Trump, oh my God. I, the, the point of my Washington Post piece was that this fake dossier was reminiscent of what the CIA was putting out about Dr. King in 1965. Uh, complete 100% horse manure malarkey. Uh, for intelligence agency executives to confront a president-elect with this sort of CRAP, I, I found that incredibly offensive. Um, and again, I, I want to make clear to you, I am an Ed Snowden supporter. Um, and, you know, I voted, you know, I voted for Hillary. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for coming. Greatly enjoyed this, David.